Greetings, everyone. My name is Kate McConnell. Today, we're virtually launching the UNA Global South and Diaspora Action Committee. I am reaching out to you because I need your help. We need your help to end poverty, violence, and inequality. This is the beginning of our first campaign. We need to galvanize as many of you as possible to advocate for the most disfranchised in the world. Although this is a workshop, we don't just want to talk about the issues. We want to make sure to be change makers. We need to make tangible change in the injustice taking place. I'm the chair of the Global South and Diaspora Co Action Committee. We are the subsidiary of the United Nations Association, United Kingdom section, London Southeast, South, Southeast region branch. Our aim is to use UN conventions as tools for social change. We are all there today because I call for this event. I have been part of the international movement for peace and human rights for over 43 years now. We felt the weight of impending doom in various forms, whether it was anti-nukes movement in, in the 1980s or the anti-genocide and anti-war movement in the 1990s and 2000s. Nothing seems to compare the desperation and fear that we are sitting with right now. Inequality is now worse than we've ever seen. There is no, there is no such thing as job security and in many places, there are no jobs at all. Women and children are going hungry. There is no more water in the wells. The rivers are polluted. The trees are disappearing. We can't breathe. Fires in Australia, cyclone in Mozambique, droughts in the Sahel, infestation in Kenya, and even the bees are dying. The coronavirus is due to create an unrecognizable world, inequality the likes of which we've never known. In this period of late capitalism, the standardizing and systematizing of global extractive system has made it easier and easier to take from people, especially those people who've never been beggars before. Deep in the village of Africa, Asia, Latin America, there were no beggars. They were hardworking farmers. There were people who worked on the land and worked with the land to meet their needs. But this is no longer possible because of capitalist greed and climate change. I have called you all here today because we have a fight of epic proportions ahead of us. We need to arm ourselves with knowledge of this brutal economic and governing system. And if anyone is going to win this war, it will be us women. We make life. We need to give birth to a powerful movement. We need to stop the injustice. The Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women is our tool. And today we are in a boot camp. We need to take this opportunity to learn as much as possible about this weapon. And then we need to wield, wield it mightily. I am also here to introduce my community of Global South women and community organizers, as well as the diaspora communities in the Global North and my fellow women activists from all backgrounds to learn about the convention of the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. 
as community organization, I know this convention ought to be a tool we use to demand our rights to our bodies, ourselves, to support each other. And to have this planet, Mother Earth, we need to stand up today. We need to stand together to demand political rights. We need to learn together how to make those demands with the tools we have. We need to learn the tools and how to use them. We hope this is the first of many workshops towards that step. We hope that we can use our rage at the state of the world to fuel a revolution towards freedom for all people. Before I pass the mic, I want to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of SOAS Festival of Ideas, Dr. Amina Yakin, Angelika Baskera, and Stephanie Gurian. They have created this platform for us to bring this workshop to all of you. A special thank you to Vivian Hayes of the Women's Resources Center for making this event happen. I encourage you all to take advantage of the WRC's services. I want to thank Catherine Plyer, a representative of the United Nations Association Leather. Catherine and the other members of Leather have helped to sponsor this event and our vision for the UNA Global South and Diaspora Action Community Committee. Without their support, we could not have done, we could not have made this workshop happen. Catherine saw, saw my potential, uplifted my vision, and has helped me make my dreams for this group come true. <clears throat> now we are working together to bridge the communication gap between the haves and the have not. We are bringing the tools to activists in the global south and the global north. The UNA Global South and Diaspora Action Committee aims to address the issues concerning rural people, women and children, and all of the dis disenfranchised and marginalized people of the world. We want to do this by using this platform and allowing all of us to be participants in these discussions and do, to determine our own destiny. A great big welcome to Catherine Plyer. Good morning. My name is Catherine Plugas. Welcome to this event on CEDAW, hosted by WNC and, as just explained, by UNA Global South Action Group Committee, which we at UNA Trust are absolutely delighted to support. I'm a member of UNA. United Nations Association. We are a group of people from all walks of life. We work to support the UN. We are not the UN, we support them. We do this in many ways, information meetings, hustings, mongers for school, schools, fundraising, lobbying MPs campaigns, but probably one job we do, which is important, we challenge our government to fulfill its obligations on the Security Council. It is the pen holder at the moment, and we put pressure on the government to properly engage with the UN, by example. As a committee member of UNA London and Southeast region, I help look after the branches of the interests of 23 branches. And this week, 
we are recognizing the and, and presenting a week long workshop started last Sunday on major UN themes to mark United Nations 75th anniversary, which is a global event. Um, I'm also chair of UNA Trust. Our job is to fund projects compatible with the ideals of the UN. We have just launched a fund for refugees affected by COVID. And um, if, any, if anybody wants to know any more about that, uh, if you email me after the event, or if you get in touch with Kayat, and she will then pass it through to me. I thought I'd give a bit of background to Sedor, very general. <clears throat> the Charter of the United Nations was signed on the 26th of June, 1945, San Francisco, came into force on the 24th of October that year originally signed by 50 countries, 51 later in that year when Poland signed up, but now we have 193 countries um, are now members. Um, the open, opening words are legendary. We, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. The second statement ties in with tonight. We, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, and of nations large and small. I mentioned this second statement of the Charter, reaffirming human rights just now, as this obviously ties up quite strongly with today's topic. Sedor, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women is also called the Bill of International Rights for Women. Over the years, a huge amount of legislation has been produced by the UN on the subject of human rights in general and for women in particular. The UN recognizing that women bear children less mobile than men, more often than not find themselves head of family, sole breadwinner, denied their basic human rights for many reasons and because of the situation in which they find themselves. It has been recognized by the UN that these women, all of us need extra legislation to protect us. To mention some examples of major legislation instigated by the UN, which some of you will be familiar with. 1995, the Beijing Declaration. 2000, UNSCR, United Nations Security Council Resolution, 1325, Women, Peace and Security. 2008, UNSCR, 1820, Sexual Violence in Armed Conflict, which was one of about four or five resolutions following 1325, honing it down. Everybody will have heard of the Millennium Goals, which came into being 2000. Number three, millennium goal number three, promote gender equality and empower women. The millennium goals were rehashed and they were replaced in 2015 by the sustainable development goals, 17 of those. Goal number five is gender equality and the sustainable goals um, are up for review um, 2030. CEDAW, a human rights treaty, came into force in 1981. It is one of the most important examples of legislation for women we have. It was drafted by CSW, Commission for the Status of Women, which was actually set up um, quite shortly after the setting up of the UN. It was set up partially by Eleanor Roosevelt in 1946. The CSW meets government, and the development community to look at government performance on women's issues every year 
in New York in March, International Women's Day. That's a, week event, a weekly event. It, hosts, it also hosts a major world conference on women every five years. Of these, the Beijing meeting, the Beijing meeting in 1995, which led to the Beijing Declaration, became a blueprint for future meetings with its 12 point plan for the advancement of women. Um, finally, the UN created GEAR, UN Women in 2010, a dedicated and funded department to look at the advancement of every aspect of women's lives, economic development, education, health, sexual violence, so on and so forth. Finally, just something which we're going to be discussing in detail. Um, CEDAW is a document. It has no teeth until a government has signed up to it. But even if the government signs up to it, any government, we then have to come in and ensure that the, um, the document to which the government has signed is properly implemented. Um, so it, the government actually does what it says it's agreed to do. Um, I think that's enough from me. I'm absolutely delighted to hand you over to Vivian Hayes, CEO of Women's Resource Center. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. And good morning, everybody, and good morning, women. Um, thank you also to Kayette and to the women who've arranged this, particularly to Stephanie for helping me um, with the tech stuff, because I'm not very techy. But I'm glad lots of women are. We need to be in that space, women. Uh, yes, so good morning and welcome again. Um, I'm very pleased to be here to talk about CEDAW or the long title, the convention to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women, or as Catherine said, we call it the International Bill of Rights for Women because that's a bit more accessible language. Um, so um, I'm going to tell you a bit about myself, a bit about um, the organization I lead, the Women's Resource Center, and then I'm going to hopefully um, bring CEDAW to life because the UN language and website is really inaccessible. Um, and as I often say, CEDAW is one of the best kept secrets. And today I hope that we're going to make some inroads into changing that because as we know, knowledge is power and things that are kept secret usually are because they're very useful to us, the change makers. Okay, so as Catherine said, I'm Vivian Hayes. I'm the Chief Executive of the Women's Resource Centre. And I have been involved in uh, the UK women's sector. By that, I mean the, the women's not-for-profit sector that has worked for probably in this country for about um, 50 years um, on addressing uh, the structural inequality of women um, and pressing for change and also providing services to women in dire need because of structural inequality. Uh, and so myself, I've worked in the sector for over 30 years. <clears throat> I'm absolutely passionate about women and children's rights. Um, I think a blueprint for the achievement of all women's rights, not just some, but all, is actually the way that we get a blueprint for everybody's rights. Um, women are across all communities. They're everywhere. We are everywhere. If you talk about um, race, women are there. If you talk about disability, women are there. We are everywhere. So if we get it right for all women, we are well on the road to creating the kind of society that Kayat referred to. Um, and we are in the worst situation in my living memory. Our rights are being rolled back. So CEDAW is a very important tool for us to grasp onto and force change because as you all know 
our rights have never been handed down to us ever. We've only improved our rights because of our collective action together to push for them. So if we want a better world, we have to do something about it. That could be one little thing. Anyway, so the work of WRC. The Women's Resource Centre is um, a national UK organisation. Our job primarily is to support what we think are 20,000 women's organisations across the country. Mostly nobody's ever heard of them. Um, they're working away in communities, supporting women across a whole range of issues that are a direct result of structural inequality. So that could be around violence against women. It could be around health. It could be around employment opportunities and financial independence. Um, it could be on uh, specific issues to specific communities, such as migrant women, uh, black and minoritized women and disabled women. The list goes on because as I'm sure you know, women all over the country and the world are very busy keeping their families and communities together. So um, some of the work we do um, is to, it basically goes into two parts. One is to try and improve the external environment. So get the government to make better policy decisions that lead to better outcomes for women. At the same time, we're working very hard to make sure those organizations still keep their doors open because the women's sector is run on a shoestring budget and it's full of women like you and I who do it because we are passionate about social change. It's not a job, it's a vocation and a way of life. Um, some of our work involves trying to attract additional money into the sector. And over the last 16 years I've been at WRC, um, our work has seen millions of extra pounds come into our sector so that often life-saving services remain open for women, so they have somewhere to go and that they don't have to die, because that is the reality. Women are dying. Um, we also run um, training programmes. We've got a fantastic feminist leadership programme that has been targeted at women younger than me because we do need to pass the baton on women. So for, for those on, on, on the event today who are middle-aged or older, we need to think about what we're passing on to the next generation and so that there is a continuum of learning and action. Because what seems to me is that every 20 years, her story gets rubbed out and people feel they have to start from scratch again. Another thing that we're doing, um, we've just, um, my colleague has just launched our network for black women leaders because we were asked by some of our members to do this um, over a year ago. Actually, it, it was at our CEDAW event over a year ago, it might be two years ago now with this lockdown, it's very hard to keep track of time. Uh, we were approached to start that network um, because obviously, um, we absolutely recognise and acknowledge um, the structural inequality that black and minoritised women face in not just in this country, but everywhere, but our work is focused here. And of course, Black Lives Matter has highlighted that in case anybody was in any doubt. I don't think there were. I just think uh, the white population chooses to ignore it. Don't get me started on issues of power because that's not quite what I'm here to speak about. Uh, so that's another one of our projects. Um, we also try to bring um, funders, trusts and foundations who make grants to our sector on board with the needs of our sector. So at the moment, we're having a lot of conversations with funders about if you believe in change and you actually want to address structural inequality, then we know you need to fund those organizations in local communities led by the people that they work with. That is critical for change. Um, we also know from um, numerous reports and research that the biggest change 
um, is elicited not not by having more women parliamentarians actually because we could just have a hundred Mrs Thatchers in Westminster I don't think that'd help us very much but the change um, in women's rights is predominantly brought about and it's a critical factor is the independent collective action of women so never be in any doubt women that it's us that makes the change not the politicians we push them there we force them to do that. And that's what we have to continue to do together. Together being the key word here. So I'm really, really excited about the collaboration today um, with Catherine and Kayette because I have met Kayette before, but Catherine, I haven't. And I'm already realizing that we've been missing a link there between the work of WRC on CEDAW and the work that Catherine and Kayette are involved in. So that's a great learning for me and I will take that away. Um, so if I ask um, the wonderful tech support to um, put on our screen the first page, because what I'm going to do is just go through the, um, the process of CEDAW and what it is, um, because it is really in inaccessible. So we produce this guide so that it, it it brings it to life in plain English and hopefully that more women can engage with it because the language that's used from the UN is quite inaccessible. So as um, my um, colleague Catherine said, CEDAW is the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women uh, or the International Bill of Rights for Women. And there you have the dates of when it was adopted, when it became an international treaty, and when the United Kingdom ratified it, which was 1986. Um, the, the countries that have ratified are called state parties, but that just means the country. Um, and it is very much focused on what we call substantive equality for women. And that is really important because what we've had in the past in this country is talk of equal opportunity. Um, equal opportunity does not achieve outcomes. We can see that when we look around us. Change has not occurred in terms of structural inequality for women. Um, and so CEDAW is about substantive equality, which means actually realizing change, not just saying, hey, we've got a nice job here. Anybody can apply for it. And so people apply. And we know from research that um, if you've got an Asian or African sounding name, up to 80% of those people's applications will go in the bin. So equality of opportunity doesn't work. We've got to have institutional shift. Um, there's a lovely um, example of what substantive equality means in a, in a visual, which um, I'm sorry, I haven't gotten, but you've probably seen it already. And it shows three people wanting to watch um, a football match over a fence and they're all different heights. So somebody comes along and they've got a box to stand on, which are all the same heights. So what that does is raises them all by a foot, but it means that the smallest person still can't see over the fence. So in order to achieve equality um, and women's rights, we have to address the specific needs of women and within that, the specific needs of women from different communities. Um, so that would mean the boxes would have to be different heights so that everybody could see equally over the fence. So that's what, for me, substantive equality means is addressing the need and acknowledging um, the, uh, the lack of rights and how they apply to different groups of women and tackling that directly. Treating people the same will never, ever achieve equality. So the, thing, the other thing that I love about CEDAW, it's not about comparing um, men with women. It's about comparing the performance of the state to date with what it said it will do. So it's only focused on women, um, which is great because we don't get much that's for ourselves. And I've got a bit of an issue with the language that's used. 
I talk about women's human rights, not gender equality, because that can get a little bit into a gray area where men go, well, gender equality, what about my rights? No, we're talking about women's human rights. If men want to address issues they feel they may have, then that is for them to do it, not for women. We've got enough to do, thank you very much. And also, men do not experience structural inequality because of their sex. They might experience it because of racism or because of homophobia or class, but not because of their sex alone. Okay, so if I look at um, what I've shown you all, because um, I think the other thing that I want to just go back to is what Catherine said about the legal standing of CEDAW. And lots of people say that CEDAW has no teeth. That's often a phrase that you heard, um, that you hear. And it is not legally binding in our country. And I think sometimes for that reason, people think it's of no use. That is not true. It's of great use. It does have um, what's called, and you can see on your screen, is the optional protocol, which is the nearest thing to um, holding the government to account in a very formal way. Uh, the optional protocol is not a simple process and it can take several years, but we know that different um, women's human rights defenders around the globe have used the optional protocol for change. In particular, um, in the context of the UK, very recently, and I'm sure many of you know about, is um, the changes to access to abortion in Northern Ireland. Those changes are a direct result of women's human rights defenders in Northern Ireland using the CEDAW and optional protocol to bring about that change. I think it's taken them several years and um, at uh, one of our, our last CEDAW kind of live event where we were there together, we had women from Northern Ireland come over to talk about their experience. And it was really fabulous because they said they'd been to one of our conferences many years ago about CEDAW and afterwards they got together and they were reflecting and talking about their experience. And they thought, well, you know, shall we give it a go? Shall we take, take a case under the optional protocol about abortion? And they just decided to do it and get on with it. And here we are today because of their first steps and then garnering support from various other places and a fabulous campaign. They've actually realized that change. And that's a great example of how CEDAW can be used. Um, but of course, as Catherine says, CEDAW is only as useful as we make it because it is a document, it's uh, uh, statements and recommendations. Unless we push the government on those, they generally do nothing. That's about substantive equality. The other thing that I love about CEDAW is the fact, and it says under the st substantive equality box, um, this thing about temporary special measures. Now, temporary special measures are a gift to us because what it means is, is that our government can go, okay, there's just been no progress on, and well, it, it's been kind of used in terms of women, women MPs. And you may know that for a while, there were all women shortlists. That is a temporary special measure. It's taking a specific positive action to bring about change that is not happening. So it's really useful for us to say in our um, efforts to decision makers, well, you know, you can use temporary special measures to address this. Because sometimes, you know, people will say, oh, it's a long road, change takes a long time, you've got to be patient, we're doing our best and we're sitting here going, actually, this is not good enough. Why do we have to wait so long? How long are we meant to wait? And so temporary special measures can be fully and legally implemented to speed up that change. So remember that one. I think it's a really easy thing 
uh, to talk about and it's easy for people to understand. Um, tech support, could I have the next page, please? Okay, so the seed or process. The convention is overseen and monitored by a UN committee of 23 experts on women's rights from around the world. Often, uh, many of those experts are actually legally trained, um, legal experts. State parties are obliged to report to committee to examine the measures implemented by the country. And this happens approximately every four years. So every four years, all the countries that have signed up to CEDAW, including the UK, and I think there's about 170 something, I'm not sure. Um, they are asked to provide a report on their progress since the last examination four years ago. Um, and then they are examined. So if you look at this lovely circle with the women's symbol in the middle, you can see year one, the state party, the country, submits their report to the committee, which outlines their progress to upholding the articles. The articles are like the areas that are focused on there at the side of the frame, you can see that. Um, now, in our experience, and WRC has been uh, leading on writing what is called the shadow report. So when the government writes their report, um, civil society, NGOs, the women's sector, we are able to submit a parallel report, um, which gathered, which we have led on for, I don't know, before I joined WRC. There used to be um, the Women's National Commission in this country and they, um, they produced quite a large report, a shadow report against the government's report. But we as an organization were always asked to supplement that um, because there were certain areas that they avoided that were seen as too contentious. Um, so we, we began when the, the WNC was abolished um, when the Lib Dem government got in. Um, and since then we've been doing a much bigger report. Um, but that process is critical because what we find is that the government's report to CEDAW does not tell the truth, to put it bluntly. Um, and so we, because we're the umbrella body and we've got a network of over 600, we have access across the country to local small women's organisations across the whole communities of women. And so we consult with them either through actual events or through them sending us written evidence that speak to the articles that you can see on your screen. So um, we might, um, one of the things that's not on there, but it's in the general recommendation is the one on violence against women and girls, because initially, as you can see, there isn't an article relating to it. But again, because of um, representations made by women's organizations, violence against women and girls became a general recommendation. And so we might have organizations working like Rape Crisis England and Wales or in Khan who, who might submit evidence around violence against women and girls and that will go in our report. Um, so it's a lot of work um, and it requires um, a great collaboration between many women's organizations and individual women um, to get this report robust, um, evidence-based, and really shining a light on what the government hasn't been doing. And sometimes what they have been doing that is detrimental to women. So we know that austerity in this country has massively impacted women by over 80%. And so the policies that they have brought out have actually discriminated against women. And I would say that they have broken their own equality laws by some of the policy making. So we spend time gathering the information and then we submit our report. Then the committee looks at the government's report and our parallel report. And in year two, based upon those, 
presents a list of issues that they will ask clarification on, which the government will do and which we may update on ours as well. But usually the list of issues, because our reports are very thorough and tell the truth, then we've normally all, already covered that off. The next phase is um, the examination of our country, which has happened in person. The last exam examination happened in Geneva. They're either in Geneva or New York, really, uh, usually. Um, and the government have to go. They send civil servants usually. Sometimes the minister for women and equalities might go. And if we can afford it, or if we're fortunate enough to get a grant, we will go as well. Um, now, this is one of my bugbears about CEDAW, is that it, it's, it's dominated, in my view, in terms of who can go to the hearing by women who can afford it. And in that context, what we often see is that it's white middle class women who get to go. That's not OK at all, because we know what without the diversity of women being able to attend that some issues will not be spoken about. Our job at WRC is to make sure the voices of the most marginalized women um, and the women at the very sharp end of structural inequality, that their issues are there, that they get to speak and represent. Um, so at the last hearing, um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission made some grants um, for organizations to travel to Geneva. And I smile because that was a challenge. That was a great challenge. So we had already in our report consulted with over a hundred women's organizations, um, but the grant system of the HRC for women to go was open to everyone. And so there were some people that went who hadn't been part of our process of evidence collecting. So we had a group of, I think about, 30 or more and some of whom had been very involved in the shadow report process and some who haven't so we had a, a range of knowledge and understanding of what had been going on now the other thing um, is that the UN committee in previous years and I just want to say that I'd never been before <laughs> the last time they had criticized the UK delegation for not being organized. And, um, you know, this may be controversial to say, but again, because it has predominantly been women with the means and the resources, which predominantly has been white middle-class women as individuals going, the, the kind of coordinated approach to talking to the committee was, lacking and the committee noted that. Now we all know that if we want to talk to people in power, we need to make sure that we're prepared, that we know what we're saying and that we're speaking with one voice. Because if we don't, we um, open ourselves up to being divided even further. So um, the, the main opportunity at the examination is that the NGOs, us as the women's sector, are given 10 minutes to give oral evidence. So we get a 10 minute slot to speak to the committee um, to highlight any specific things that we think are really important so that when they question our government, they are armed with the correct information to ask pertinent questions. It's critical. Otherwise, the committee don't know what to say. I mean, if you think that they're they're doing this all the time and they've got a hundred and odd countries. They cannot know in detail what's going on in every country. So it is our job to make sure that they have that information. So um, before we left to go to Geneva, um, I ended up coordinating the people that were going and explaining the process because as I said, some people going did not understand the process and they didn't understand the 10 minutes oral evidence. And what we had was people very focused on their specific issues. And the aim of the, or the 10 minutes that we had to speak is to speak to the strategic overarching issues. 
that would be the aim of this. Anyway, so after much work, blood, sweat and tears, I might say, and my very best communication skills being needed. And as an author, I can be blunt sometimes. So that was a challenge for me. Um, we coordinated the group. We worked together. I worked with the other four nations. So Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales with the, the organisations, the umbrella organisations from there for us to work together and to bring everybody together and on board. Um, so um, we did that before we went through email. And then when we got there, we had like an atrium space, very strange, but we all got together and we divided into groups of themes of the overarching issues and those groups worked upon them. Um, and then we agreed what the 10 minutes oral evidence was going to be and who was going to say it. Well, it was really hard work. It was very stressful. Some people felt that their issues weren't covered. The usual thing when you're collaborating. Um, but the committee at the end of the session commended us on our excellent and coordinated approach. That was a massive achievement for us because that means that we're now respected as a country rather than seen as a little bit shambolic. Very, very important. So that happened. We were very pleased. The hard work was worth it. So then after the hearing, the examination, which we all heard our government's responses, not allowed to speak in the chamber, you can only observe. Um, but needless to say, we didn't feel that the government answered our questions very well. Also, the report that they'd sent initially, I have to say, is one of the poorest reports I've ever seen from our government. And that is indicative of the fact that women's rights have fallen off the agenda. They really have. So after the examination, then you have what is year three in your circle, which are the concluding observations. That's what they're called. They are recommendations. That's what they are, but they're called concluding observation. And usually there's a lot, 60 or 70 recommendations that the committee made to our government for areas of improvement. And this is a critical document for us as a lever of social change. There's, there's too many for the women's sector to work upon. And I just might add that most of the work that WRC does on CEDAW is not funded. It's, it's a massive challenge for us to do this work. And we rely on the goodwill and the free labour of loads of other women as well to contribute to the report and to share the evidence and to engage with the process. Um, so that again is part of this systemic um, invisibling of CEDAW and of women's rights because without resources, it's really difficult to do this work um, because women, you know, the women who we want to engage with are usually the poorest, usually got the most to do and the least time. Okay, so then we get the recommendations. And then what we do then is that we will identify with our members, which are the ones that we can, we can put our, our time into. If we had more resources, we could do so much more. So um, some examples of um, how the conclusion observations or recommendations have been used as very, very strong levers to force our government to improve women's rights. I mentioned the, the one of Northern Ireland and the optional protocol. Um, that's been a great success. But again, I think, I don't know if it was Kaya or Catherine who said, CEDAW is only as valuable as we make it. So it, it's like an opportunity. Here you go, here are the recommendations. You can bet your life that the government will do absolutely nothing about them unless they are either forced, embarrassed or shamed into doing something. So that's critical. Uh, the Northern Ireland example, which took many years and the labor of many women. The other example, um, which 
was England based because obviously Northern Ireland happened in Northern Ireland, even though we supported it, is the, um, the work around no recourse to public funds. Um, and in case anybody doesn't know um, no recourse to public funds, what that is, is that um, in our case, women with insecure immigration status um, cannot access any public money. So they can't claim benefits, legal aid. Um, and also that means if they are in um, a violent relationship, they cannot leave because they can't pay to live somewhere else because they have no access to funds. Um, so in refuges, this is a particular problem. And um, for decades, we know that the black and minoritized organizations who run refuges have been footing the bill to make sure those women can come into the, to, into the refuges and escape violence. But of course, that again is a challenge for those organizations to do it because there's been no funding. I'm pleased to say, because of the recommendations made by CEDAW around no recourse to public funds and the hard work of many organizations of a coalition led by South or Black Sisters, which my organization WRC performed the secretariat of, and a lot of work, those, some of those laws have been changed. So now there is the domestic uh, violence concession whereby with um, evidence and jumping through some hoops, women can um, access um, refuge spaces with some money available. So that's a massive change. And obviously means that numerous women's lives have saved because without being able to leave an abuser, of course you may end up dead and goodness knows your children too because children are massively affected living in a, a, a violent household. So that's just a couple of examples of where seed or recommendations or conclusion observations have been directly used to bring about an improvement of women's rights. It is hard work and it is about the dedication of women's human rights defenders pushing this and pushing it and pushing it. But it, it, it works, it's a great tool. The other thing we know is that our government does not like to be embarrassed on the world stage. The UK government um, hold themselves up um, as a great defender of human rights. Of course, that is not the case. We only have to look at what's going on at the moment to know that. But they don't like the international stage to think, oh, maybe they're not quite as good as they said they were. You know, so that's another way to encourage them or drag them to, to give change for women. So, um, years three to eight on your screen. Years three to eight is when the recommendations from the concluding observations can be worked upon again with our push. Um, the thing that's happening right now, oh, I haven't gone through the articles, have I? Um, I think they're all listed there and hopefully this, this leaflet um, will be available for you all to look at. And there's also a page on WRC's website about CEDAW, our report should be there and any other information. Um, is there another page for me to look at tech support, please? Ah, yeah. Okay, so this in a way is, is, is the page that I want you to focus on in a way because really without as many women as possible engaging and organizing together we, we don't get where we need to be and as Kay had said we were in, we are now in the worst possible times um, and we also know that regardless of, 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 of the leaders of change often being visible as men we know that it's women doing the work and behind that saying, behind every great man is a great woman. Well, there's probably about 20 great women, but there you go. Um, now, at the last examination, um, 
and from the concluding observations, the committee have asked our government to report early because normally the cycle is every four years approximately. But the committee, if they feel that something is of significant concern to them, then they will ask our government to report to report within one or two years on those issues. And that happened at the last examination. Um, the four areas that they've been asked to report on, which I think it's February next year, possibly it is next year, are the incorporation of CEDAW into domestic law throughout all territories under its jurisdiction. Now, this is a big one because our government has um, consistently refused to incorporate CEDAW into our own legal frameworks. Um, they give some quite hilarious excuses, which if you look at their reports, you can see one of the ones that made me laugh the most um, was that they say, well, we can't do that. We'd be giving more rights to women than we would to anybody else, which of course is ridiculous. Um, so they've been asked to report again on that. Undertake number two, a thorough impact assessment of its withdrawal from the European Union on the rights of women, because obviously Brexit um, is here and with us. And all the, um, all the investigations and reports around Brexit that have been conducted um, with a lens on women have shown that women's rights are definitely going to roll back with Brexit because although our own equality law um, requires that attention is paid to what are called um, protected characteristics, so basically they're the groups in the law that are identified as suffering um, specific discrimination and equality and one of those is based upon sex so women um, the government fails over and over again in its policy making to do what we call equality impact assessments that's another thing that i suggest that you find out about if you don't know about because equality impact assessments are really useful tools and there is provision for those made in the equality act the government doesn't do them or does them really badly because basically if you're bringing in a new policy so um for example what could we have um benefits for single parents for example um the government should have a look oh is this going to impact men and women differently um and as you probably know over 90 percent of single parents in this country are women so if they looked at that they'd see that the impact of any policy around that would impact women more than men, which means they would need to um, either make adjustments or a very good excuse for not, for not addressing it. Often they just make excuses. But again, the more that we talk about these things, the more pressure we put on them to do them. Um, number three, to include the provision of the European Con Convention on Human Rights and the accumulated legislation legal acts and court decision of the European Union, it's its national legislation and include human rights and the empowerment in the center of its approaches to tackling the current challenges. So this is related to the concerns that Brexit will allow our government to withdraw um, from the European Convention on Human Rights and other European directives and treaties that have quite significantly benefited women. We, we are concerned that the government will use Brexit as an opportunity to really dismantle some of, some of the human rights gains that we have. Um, and you may know that indeed uh, the government has at various points talked about uh, revising our own human rights legislation and we should all be alarmed about that and we should make sure that we know what's going on um, because they could kind of do it through the back door with hardly anybody realizing what's happening. Number four, to consider establishing a national oversight mechanism to coordinate and monitor the implementation of the convention with the effective participation 
of its national human rights institutions and women's organizations. This is another one that we think is um, an overarching um, and of strategic importance. What it means is, is that the government through signing up to CEDAW is meant to have what's called gender architecture. So they're meant to have a process and system of implementing CEDAW and engaging um, with women's organizations to um, assess where we're at and also improve. Now, as I said at the beginning, we used to have what was called the Women's National Commission, which was a quango. So it was kind of semi-independent of government, but it was funded by government and sponsored by government. And I was one of the group of the last commissioners before it was abolished. And, you know, I had a lot of criticisms of the Women's National Commission, particularly in relation to um, its lack of diversity. However, now that it's gone, I realize that we have nothing left. You know, um, we don't have uh, a voice into government as a collective at all. What we have is the people with the means and who are have the, the resources um, and also perhaps the connections to lobby the government. But those of us outside of that, so working class women, black women, disabled women, women in the North who don't have those means, they have no opportunity um, to make representations. And the government also does not have to deal with a committee of women who are challenging them. Um, so that will be very interesting to see what the government says to number four. Indeed, it will. OK, so we've got this question here. Does it seem overwhelming and difficult to know what to do from here? Because I have to say, you know, 12 years ago, I could not get my head around seed or it just seemed like a foreign language to me. And it also seemed um, unreachable in many ways. Uh, but now I'm a fan of CEDAW and I, 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 I think it's a great tool. I think we've just got to demystify it a bit and put it into plain English because CEDAW is for us. It's for all women. It, it's especially useful for the women with the least and who are the most oppressed. So what we've got underneath is engage with seed or some some suggestions of how you might get engaged with seed or and i hope that you'll want to um and you can also contact us women's resource center i'm sure um one of the very tech women will put the link to our website somewhere for you to access and i just want to thank the women who are doing this because i'm just terrible at it so one of the things you could do um, is find out which recommendation and you will see um, the concluding observations support on our website with the list of recommendations. Go have a look through those and see which one speaks to you the most or the things that you're passionate about or the women that you work with, which one speaks to you the most. And then start to say them. So when you're in conversations with decision makers, funders, whoever, the powerful, is talk about that recommendation. You can say, did you know, number 25 recommendation in the concluding observations of CEDAW says, we want to know what are you doing about that? What do you think about that? Do you know that that's what our work is here to address? Blah, 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 blah. You can contact your MP, or the councillors in your local authority, and you can ask them what are they doing about the CEDAW recommendations, or if they are producing a policy that you think di is in direct opposition to that recommendation, you can say, did you know that this is going against the CEDAW recommendation? It's great for opening up a conversation. And the other thing that we find is that a lot of those MPs or councillors will never heard of CEDAW. So what it does as well, it empowers you, you know, because often in, in these relationships with the people who have, or the people that we want to affect change with, we're, we're, we're always kind of the poor relation, if you like. We're the ones going almost 
begging them for change. No, with CEDAW, you're not begging them for change. You're saying, do you know this is your responsibility? But you're also showing them that you know more than them. And sometimes that's really useful. So what's the next suggestion? Use CEDAW and its language, so substantive equality, temporary special measures in your policy consultation. So I, I don't know if you're engaged in this work, but we do responses when government um, say, oh, we want to bring out this new policy, we're having a consultation, we'd like to hear your views. You can use the language of CEDAW to remind them of the obligations that they've signed up to. And there's a recommendation here. What are you doing about it? We can help you offer solutions. Um, raise awareness about CEDAW with your service users. So if you're a woman's org, or if you're not, just with anybody who's interested in women's rights. Um, because we know um, that some of our members working with, uh, with women use CEDAW. They tell the women about CEDAW so that they know what their rights are, because that again empowers them in whatever situation they're in to say, actually, under CEDAW, I think this process is not correct. And actually it goes against CEDAW. So again, it's a powerful, powerful thing to mention. Um, although CEDAW is not legally binding in this country, I know that some um, women's human rights defenders who are solicitors have used it in their cases because it adds weight to their argument that, and also not only do we think this is in breach of the UK's equality law, we think it's actually in breach of CEDAW. So it adds weight to your argument all the time. The other thing you can do is get involved in the shadow reporting process. So that's the report we do the England wide one, then we work with our sister orgs in Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland to produce the Four Nations report. So you, if you have got evidence um, around the articles that were on the other page and you want to uh, submit evidence to our report, you can do that as well. Um, and again, you can find out about what we're doing on CEDAW on our website, your campaigns, if you're campaigning on anything to do with women's human rights, use CEDAW, critical, because it's a lever again. It's not just you saying, oh, actually, this, this is not fair. This is not right. Actually, it's in contravention of CEDAW. Actually, it's in contravention of our own equality laws. Very useful. Yeah, and then it says use CEDAW with the Human Rights Act, the Equality Act. And another area of law which is useful, useful to us is public law. So that's governing what institutions should and should not be doing. And uh, public institutions have specific um, responsibilities under the Equality Act as well, where the equality impact assessments are important. So public bodies, so that would be a local authority, could be social services um, they are supposed to adhere to the Equality Act and they should be carrying out equality impact assessments on their decisions um, and equality impact assessments um, are, are, are based on the protected characteristics so you could raise issues around race, sex, disability etc as listed. Um, and you can, of course, sign up to our mailing list to find out more about what we're doing. So um, what we are currently doing, um, we're just about to um, begin our process of gathering evidence for our shadow report on those four areas that the government has to report back on next year. Because obviously, if we don't gather and submit the shadow report, the government can get away with saying they're doing a lot of things that they're actually not. Um, and so we're just about to start that process. And the first step of that will be going back to um, the organisations that presented evidence to our LASH report um, and finding out where they're at. But after doing that, we, we hope to widen that out um, to other women um, 
not just women's organisations, but for us, we know that women's organisations generally have the evidence because they work with thousands and thousands of women. So they're seeing every day what are the key issues coming up for the women they work with in their communities and localities. Okay. Um, now, one thing I forgot to say is that if you've got any questions, and we do want questions because it's really important um, that we have a conversation, um, not just Catherine, myself, and Kayette speaking at you, because what we want to do is grow the movement and the collaboration that will use CEDAW to hold this government to account. Um, it's, it's a key way to do that. Um, and we need as many women engaged in the process as possible. So there is um, there's both a chat function and a Q&A function. And the Q&A function works much better than the chat so that we can all see what the questions are. Because on the chat, it kind of disappears up the screen. So if you'd like to ask a question, or an observation or anything, please use the Q&A function um, and we'll be really happy to take your questions. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything on there at the moment. Let me just have a look, there isn't, is there? No, there isn't. Okay, so I would like to welcome back Catherine and Kaya onto the screen um, so that we are here to take your questions. Oh, great. Thank you, women and anybody else. What do you think is the significance of UN women? So, Yasmin, thank you for that question. What do I think the significance of UN women is? Okay. That's quite a difficult question for me because if I'm really honest, um, I don't know how radical the UN Women Group is, um, but I'm not engaged in it. So it's difficult for me to know. Um, I don't know if Catherine might know more about UN Women than I do. Catherine or Kayette? Can you unmute yourselves, please, sisters? Unmute yourself. Thank you. Kaya, can you unmute yourself, please? While we're waiting for Kaya. Catherine, do you know much about UN women? Um, I, I would say the fact that... Um, I think the fact that they um, the, their very existence... Um, is quite important the fact that um, it was actually recognized um, that, that this was actually needed is a good start in the right direction and it's a funded body and I think that's my answer I'm not currently working with UN Women. Okay. Um, Kayette? Uh, I haven't got very much information about the UN Women. I'm so sorry. Okay. I mean, one thing I would say, and, and you may disagree with me, is that I know there are men on UN Women, and I don't agree with that. I think women-only space is critical, and all the work that we've done and loads of other people shows that women-only space and activism is critical. And if you think about the relationships of power, then that would be obvious really, because men are used to being in a relative position of power to women. Um, and sometimes they just can't help themselves but to take over and lead. Um, and sometimes women can't help ourselves but to facilitate that. So it's critical, I think, you and women should be women. Uh, I don't, why do they need men in there? I don't know. Uh, there was, uh, in 2014, at the UN uh, New York summit, there was this campaign where, uh, you know, um, in fact, 
Emma Watson had this famous speech where she mentioned, you know, we need to involve men, you know, in, you know, to support us and also to see also where their vulnerability is, you know, they may show this uh, strength and, you know, um, this superior uh, power base, but at the same time also, you know, they, unless they recognize, you know, what women's issue are, you know, they seem to be always um, left out of uh, women's issue, even uh, as uh, basic as within the family uh, setup, you know, where men are always out of the house and uh, they don't participate in so many de decision-making uh, processes. At work is the same, but um, even within some of the women organization I have uh, been with and I'm involved in, you know, we, there is this idea where we should allow men also to see our side of the arguments. Uh, that may be a long way because when you think of in the global south, um, you know, uh, work that we're trying to do in the global south, uh, men have got an almost an absolute power where women are stifled, you know, to not to be able to function in any manner or in any uh, kind of um, even approaching, even requesting their basic need mm. uh, through political, you know, uh, power or uh, religious uh, institution or cultural institution. So women are quite um, still in that uh, victim position where we need to take some steps ahead of us before we can say, we can comfortably say, yes, we need to involve men because there are good women, the good men, you know, who can accommodate. <laughs> but yeah. the majority has shown to be, you know, very much um, women are uh, alien to their uh, part of the thinking or even placing them in the right place uh, yeah. to be participants. So yeah. I still believe, you know, women, we really need, you know, the funding and the support of organizations like UN, like other organizations. Even UN itself is dominated by the, uh, you know, um, powerful and uh, men's decision. So we yeah. need to really uh, make the efforts uh, with the tools we're going to uh, access in order really to demand these rights and uh, to demand even the rights, we need funding, we need also the right people to be yeah. um, involved in how we can achieve uh, that position. To me, it's, um, it is quite sad because I have been um, following up a lot of this COVID uh, meetings, you know, through Zoom, because we've had the luxury of following up uh, through Zoom. But the majority of those people who need the help are not anywhere in that picture. Even as we're speaking now, with all the meetings, with all the discussions, it seems we between intellectuals, between professionals, but yes. never knowing where where the money is going or where the effort they are trying to do has uh, involved the ordinary uh, people in the global south which is our main issues and um, now these opportunities on our uh, platform uh, which is given to us by UNA and uh, and Catherine's vision and we really want to work very, very hard with your organization, you know, to empower us. 
to see where we can go, where we can even start asking the question. That's where we, we are at. You know, we're not anywhere near uh, being part of the asking the question. So the mm -hmm. struggle just doesn't happen, you know, from um, a well-informed, well-organized uh, community. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I absolutely agree, Kayette, that um, women need that support. I mean, that's why I do the job I do, because we support those organisations on the ground in communities. And we know without them, women's rights would be even worse than they are now. So I absolutely agree with you that the, the women... Um, in, in the global south you're speaking you know those organizations should be the ones that are invested in I mean this drives me mad about um, uh, DFID and the international NGOs they get all the money massive organizations in this country and then they go trying across to wherever um, to address problems like they know how to address it when we have women doing that work already with nothing. Yes. That money should not be going to those organizations. It should be invested in the work that the women are leading within the communities. Yeah, I think we're also at the moment, um, some colleagues and I, we haven't got very far in it, but we, we're actually sort of very concerned on, on, on the subject of aid in general. The uh, um, we're, we're just beginning to look at it um, at the moment with Bond. We've been teaming up with them, but you know the the you talk about the impact the of COVID and and uh, the um, um, the 0.07 campaign, which is confusing for everybody, including me. I mean, I used to think it meant seven seven percent of GDP. 0.07 is less than one percent. But of course, if if the government says yes, we're we're sticking to that, aren't we wonderful? You know, we're we're not breaking any rules here. But then, of course, in a, a situation like this at the moment, when you when you have you know our sort of economic output is decimated by COVID, but then the government can absolutely clobber aid, which is what they've done, and say, well, actually, we're sticking to the 0.7. You know, with with so that's another another problem. You talk about impacts and women the aid that does get through that does go in the right directions um is is now being cut by billions of pounds i mean you've only got to look at the yemen situation and things like that and uh world food program and, and so on and so forth that can't even deliver some sort of essential aid at the moment because of the cutbacks so it's quite it's quite a it's a very complicated problem actually i mean a lot of ngos you talk about the the smaller NGOs, well, the larger ones, because I've obviously been in touch with them a lot, particularly recently because of this new working group I've set up, are in a mess. Um, you know, I mean, um, but but the smaller ones are just going to the wall. About one in 10 NGOs will be going to the wall. And that will be the kind of NGOs I would imagine that you would probably support. Vivian. Thank you. Thank you. We've got another question, women which says, do you seriously think there is genuine threat to UK remaining signatory to European Convention on Human Rights, as it was the UK lawyers primarily who drafted it? And if so, how do you suggest we campaign against it? So I think that I raised that in my presentation. Um, I think we should be very wary of what may happen. I don't think anything is off the table for this government in terms of human rights. Um, and so I think we need to keep our eye on it. Um, my answer to how do you suggest we campaign? Well, I think there'll be a whole raft of human rights lawyers who would be up in arms about that. And I think that we should if there is a campaign, I think they would probably lead it and we should support them because I'm not an expert on law. Um, and so I would support those those human rights defenders. We've just got to keep an eye on it, I think. Um, Catherine or Kayette, would you like to respond to that? 
yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert either, but um, I have to say, and like most people, I spend many hours trying to wrestle with the sophistication, if you like, of COVID, that it's destroyed so many things that we hold value, value. but one of the things it's done is stopped dissent in, in Parliament. And so things can, we've now, I've certainly noticed, and we've all noticed, you know, that things can be slipped through at tremendous speed. So I, I think that uh, it, it's a subject, it might, uh, uh, for those that are concerned about it, like the UNA, I don't think it's uh, a subject you should, you shouldn't wait until it's happened. Uh, you should sort of keep an eye because things can move extremely quickly. Yeah at the moment because of the, the fact that um, dissent has been sort of, you know, dissent is from the bedroom, so to speak. It's from, from the person's house uh, because of the COVID rules of assembly and so on. So um, that's all I've got to say on it, actually, at the moment, sorry. Um, there's a great, I don't know, can everybody, tech woman, can everybody see the Q and A's or is it just us panelists? Because somebody has written um, a paragraph about a suggestion of what we should be saying about this, which I think is really informative. So I don't know if that question about Brexit and the Convention on Human Rights can be shared with everyone on, on the meeting, because it's really good information. And thank you for that, whoever you are. Um, I, I had gonna... a question um, to change the subject. Is that all right for Vivian? Is that okay or not? I wanted you to can ask do whatever you like, my darling. I wanted Go to ask it. her about um, these. Is it twenty-four? But the people who make the 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 committee of Sedor. Yeah. Did, did you? Did I miss? Did you say who are these people and are they elected or is it like the Human Rights Council? There's a sort of revolving door. Or how yeah. do you? How does it work? So they um, they do change. Um, I don't know how often. Um, they are from different countries. And as I said, a lot of them are from the legal profession. Um, and I think that um, I could be mistaken, but I think countries can nominate people um, or people can nominate themselves. I don't know how they get elected. I apologize. I don't no, I really just know. Wondered, I wondered whether it's a bit like the process. Human Rights Council, you know, where they have. Uh, I mean, you, you get all sorts of situations in the Human Rights Council when you might get Saudi Arabia sort of, you know, judging UK because they, they have a certain amount of countries each year and it just revolves through. Uh, that was all. But It does change, definitely. Yeah. Okay. It does change. Okay. I'm just going to go back in the chat to see if there's any more questions. Um, I can't see any others. Would, um, Kaya, would you like to add anything? Yes, I would like to ask, when is the next UN meeting? Of CEDAW? Yes, C of CEDAW. For, well, you mean, well, so for the UK, it's every, approximately every four years. Mm -hmm. um, every country is examined every four years, so it depends which country um, you're in, you want to know about. Um, but for the UK, um, we've got the follow up, as I said, of the four questions for next year, but the full examination won't be for another three years because we just had one last year. What I am worried about, though, um, I forgot to mention, is that one of the several, well, there's lots of conventions on human rights. Um, and I think this, the one that's been um, in process at the moment might be um, around torture. And we have heard from orgs who would normally do a shadow report on that, that the government is saying because of Brexit, they can't do a proper report. So we're quite concerned that the government are going to use, sorry, not Brexit, are going to use the virus as an excuse for not doing a full report or indeed as an excuse for not improving um, or enacting the recommendations. But of course, the coronavirus started after the recommendations were made. So there was a period of time 
before the virus from the recommendations of CEDAW where the government could have done something. I mean, coronavirus doesn't stop them doing stuff either, I would say. Um, so we are a little bit concerned that they're going to do an even lighter touch than they did last time um, in their report. We're very mindful of that. Do you have uh, someone who is representing the African countries? The African countries? Mm -hmm. Well, um, because we focus only on our government's report, we don't actually work on any other um, country's uh, seed or work. We just work on what our government's doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's an important question, Kaya, because, you know, when we started today and you were speaking about how do we get the global south and north better to work together, I, I think there is something in... Okay, CEDAW is about individual countries, but us as women's defenders, what do we need to follow that siloing of the countries the way that they do it? Or, or is there something that we could do cross country that would actually strengthen each other? I mean, I'm, I always think everything's easy and I know it isn't. But, you know, imagine if we had um, every country signed up to CEDAW, all the women in those countries who engage with that process, if we all got together and said, right, what are we doing? What are we saying? Are we saying the same thing? Are the areas that we all need to be amplifying so that the committee hears one one to three key messages over and over and over and over and over again you know should we be doing that i don't know but i really think after today it has made me think about what are the opportunities because as you said kaya we are in we're in really I'm bad waters yeah yeah we are yes. and when when we're in those places we need to be able to um imagine and vision yes. together and, and start to work in a way that's better for us rather than fitting into the yes. silos and the ways of doing that are placed upon us. Yes. And so I, I would be really happy to have those conversations yes. about what, what that looks like, what's possible. I mean, even just for us to start the conversation would be something. Because... Within the Global uh, South uh, Committee members, there are a lot of young people, you know, from different parts of the Global South. Okay. And they're very much interested in working, you know, uh, networking. And we are pushing okay. for that. And okay. we are trying to uh, make awareness of the, you know, uh, globally. And uh, this uh, has been, in, you know, we know this is part of the UNA also initiatives, you know, where they've got so many young people working in different parts of um, uh, countries and regions. And uh, I would be very much interested to coordinate a meeting um, to to start preparing something towards, um, you know, networking with us, all of us. Yeah, and I think because of now we're doing everything on Zoom, the mm. opportunity to break down those borders has become more apparent to us, yes. hasn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's less costly also, you know. Yeah. And... Um, We've got really talented young people who are very much interested in that. Okay, well, let's let's us um, let's just speak afterwards about what we should do as a starter on that. I'd be very interested to do that, Kaya, and thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions to our lovely attendees? Who I'm so sad that we cannot see you all. Yes, that's a shame. Um, because it is, because it's always lovely to see, I'm assuming you're all women, you may not be, 
Um, oh, we've got um, a message here saying, uh, SOAS Nigerian Alumni Society is interested in further discussions, please. Um, I don't know if um, Stephanie or anybody else has a link to um, that society, um, but can we, can we make sure that we involve them, please, and we invite them or somebody from there? Is that possible, Stephanie, for you to have the name or the email? Or uh, Olafunke, if you could, oh, have you got an email, Olafunke, that you can let Stephanie have to share with us so we can catch up with you? Um, and you've also written, could you share the link? Is that, a, what's that link that you want to know? Sorry, if I'm not catching the drift. Stephanie, is that possible? Do you know this? Ah, thank you, Funke. I'm gonna write that down on my piece of paper and I will get in touch with you. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Okay, so if there are no further questions, people, women, um, then we're going to um, close this session. Um, it's been really great for me because I've met Kaya and Catherine and also um, Olafunke as well, who's interested, um, that we might now start to have some exciting conversations um, about moving our work forward in a more wider collaboration, which is fantastic. Um, I just wanna say personally, um, not only thanks to um, my sister speakers, but also um, to the women who have put this on, um, to Kaya and Stephanie to coming to see me months and months ago about this before lockdown, um, and to the people that have made it possible through the resourcing. Oh, I've got another message from Jija, sorry if I've spent, spell, uh, said your name wrong. Jija, we would love to have you involved. You can either put your email up or you can um, email WRC about CEDAW with this, the heading CEDAW. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and really just uh, hope you all have a good weekend because it is the weekend as well. Thank you for joining us. Um, the next session um, of the SOAS Festival Ideas, what a brilliant title, um, starts at one o'clock and it is um, the South Asian Multilingual Performance, Kabir by Vipal Ricky and Bengal Kowal by Armin Fakir. Uh, so I hope you enjoy that. Um, somebody just said about the alarm increase in domestic violence, what can be done? Um, we in the women's sector and the violence against women and girls sector are working on that. There's fortnightly meetings held nationally um, and it is a big issue, absolutely. Um, if you are interested, again, contact WRC. If we don't do it, we definitely know somebody who does, so feel free. Um, thank you so much, women, and um, thank you for having me uh, and also for the questions. Thank you very much, Vivian. You yes, have made fantastic. It possible. Thank you, Vivian. Yes. yes, thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much for making it possible for us to Pleasure. <laughs> start a new life. A new five. Of course, you'll be sending the bill in quite soon. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Thank you.